Okay, um, I think we can get started. We're still missing a few people, but uh, let's uh, get started. Right. So, um, so this class, we're gonna continue our discussion on the cyclones. The last class, we mainly introduced the mechanism of the cyclones, how does it work, right? Um, basically, uh, we also derived the equation uh, for looking at the, the cutoff size, which is basically the size that has 50% collection efficiency. Right, so we've done that by um, we've done that by setting up a simple equation by equating the drag force with the centrifugal force. So we can uh, qualitatively derive this uh, quite complex equation here. Right. So uh, as a recap, right, the, the, so the cyclones uses a centrifugal force to remove the particles, and so based on mechanism, we know that the collection efficiency is really depend on how large the particle is, right? So if I just do a quick, very simple quiz here. Let's see. Yeah, so, so how does the removal efficiency change, of, change as a function of size? Does it increase with the size or decrease with the size? Okay, five more seconds. All right, we'll stop here. And this is the result. Um, so basically for the cyclones, the larger the particle size, the higher the collection efficiency. So we give an extreme example of throwing a potato inside, right? So if, it, if it's a particle is as large as a potato, it's gonna directly get collected. And then if the particle size is very small, just like air molecules, um, they will just go with the flow. It's never going to get collected on the wall. So because um, that's the cyclone is not separating oxygen or nitrogen out of the flow. Right? So if the particle size is very small, then it's gonna be quite ineffective. Actually, um, we mentioned that the collection efficiency of PM 2.5 is already zero to 40%, right? So the collection efficiency is relatively low. Uh, it's relatively low um, compared to the um, compared to the larger particles. Okay, so I also sorry I missed a few chats. Um, so that was not about the project, but um, indeed this contents we, uh, we we're learning right now the cyclones. That's a part of your project design. Okay, so. Um, in your project, basically, you want to design uh, PM removal devices. It's either with a pre-cleaner, so we also call Cyclone as a pre-cleaner, mainly because they can remove a lot of large particles. So once the flue gas is formed, the Cyclone is basically the first device that's treating the, um, treating the particles because um, Cyclone is very efficient in terms of large particles. Right? So we can get rid of most of the large chunks of the particles out of the flue gas and then the downstream uh, particle collection systems can deal with the remaining smaller particles um, so um, so that's why in your project uh, you see it's either pre-cleaner with a, a backhouse filter or pre-cleaner with esp so the pre-cleaner pre is the uh, cyclone that we're talking about right so based on the pm mass pm concentration or the size distribution you should be able to design a cyclone that suits the purpose of removing the particles, okay? Um, so basically from that quiz problem, um, we should bear in mind that the cyclone efficiency increases with particle size. And more on a theoretical point of view, that's decide, decided by these two equations, right? So for these two equations, first, uh, with any geometry or working condition of the cyclone, we should be able, should be able to cu uh, calculate this cutoff size. 
So basically, this cutoff size is or is the characteristic size of the particle that's corresponding to each working condition of the cycle. And more specifically, at this cutoff size, and the collection efficiency is 50%, right? So the way we do that is first we calculate this DPC or the cutoff size and then plug it in here, right? And then for particles with any size, we just plug in that size and then we can calculate what is collection efficiency. So for example, last class we, we said that um, DPC, let's say is five microns. And then if the particle has a, si has a size of five micron, then five divided by five, that's one. And then one divided by one plus one, that's 50%. That's why at the cutoff size, the collection efficiency is 50. But if you have a very large size, say the, the size is five millimeter, right? So five micron divided by five millimeter, that's very small. We can regard it as zero. So one divided by one plus zero, that's one, which means that particles with very large size, the collection efficiency is one, right? It's 100%. But for very small particles, if we plug in this value here, say five nanometer, then five micron divided by five nanometer, that's 1,000. So further you have 1,000 squared. So you're going to divide one by this very large number in the denominator, and right? you'll get almost zero in terms of collection efficiency. So that's how um, basically this equation decides um, the collection efficiency should increase with the particle size, right? So last class, we finished at this problem um, because right now we know the equation to calculate what is the collection efficiency at each specific size. But what about real application of the cyclones? Uh, so in real applications, we first need to know what is the size distribution of the particles. So if you uh, still remember, about the size distribution, we had a semi-log plot, right? So basically on the x-axis, that's a cumulative, cumulative fraction. Y-axis is the particle size, right? We had the, uh, the, the semi-log plot that when all the data points align on a street line, it's a log normal distribution. So um, basically for treating these flue gas, treating these uh, PM containing gas, we need to first know what is the size distribution of it. And then we can calculate what is the removal efficiency of all the different particles, okay? So for, the, uh, for example, this problem wants us to calculate the overall collection efficiency of a cyclone when it's dealing with certain flue gas. So let's go through this problem and I'll guide you through the calculation on how to derive the equation. So it wants us to consider a conventional cyclone of a classical proportion as described by uh, LAPO. So this conventional cyclone, as we discussed last time, um, we can find all its geometry from this table. That's table 4.2 on your textbook. So for this conventional cyclone, uh, it's basically referring to these two columns, okay? We mentioned that we, have, we can have high efficiency, we can have it or have high throughput, right? So for conventional cyclones, we're dealing with these two columns. And generally, generally we'll just choose number three here. Uh, so there may be some problems that want you to use another dimension for the cyclone, but uh, here let's just assume that we're using number three, right? So in terms of number three, what that means is you see all the diameters or all the uh, geometry dimensions, they're normalized by the body diameter, which is the capitalized D, right? So basically what that means is once we know the body diameter, for example, if it's one meter, then we should be able to calculate all the other dimensions. Excuse me? Yes? It's okay to table number three or four? Uh, it's gonna be either number three or number four. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, but most of the situations we're going to use number three. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah we're going to use number three, right? So, for example, in here, uh, if we know the diameter is one meter, then we know the height, that's going to be H over D is 0.5, right? The height is going to be 0.5 meters. Here is one meter. And then for the width of the inlet, W, that's 0.25. 
right? And then the exit uh, diameter of the gas exit, DE, that's going to be 0.5, right? The length of the vortex finder, S, that's 0.625. So then the length of the body is going to be, the ratio is 2, right? So this is going to be 2 meters. And here, finally, the length of the cone, that's going to be 2, to be two meters as well. Right. So based on um, this table here, if we know any, um, if we know basically, if we know the diameter of the body, then we should be able to calculate all the other dimensions. Right. But um, when we derive or when we calculate the efficiency of the cyclone, the most important the most important parameters are the body diameter, height, width, length of the body and length of the cone. So these five parameters will decide what is going to be the collection efficiency. Okay, so we, we really don't need to consider about the other parameters. The other parameters will just decide what is the construction cost, or what is the dimension, what is the um, occupancy of the space for the cycle. Okay. So these are the five important parameters and we'll see how it's going to affect our calculation. Okay. So further, um, you see for this problem, um, apart from using the dimension of the conventional cyclone, it's actually assuming the body diameter is one meter, which is quite convenient. We don't need to do any other calculations. But if it's 0.5, then the other dimensions have to scale with this body diameter, right? And then it has a flow rate of 100 meter cube per minute. So the flow rate, if you recall, the flow rate decides what is the what is the inlet velocity, right? So higher the flow rate, basically the higher the velocity of the particle. And then if a larger particle have a much higher velocity there, then it's going to be easier for them to get collected, right? And then we further assume certain environmental conditions, for example, the temperature and the pressure. And then we have the density of the particles, which is 1600 kilogram per meter cube. And the most important thing here is the size distribution, right? So we mentioned that the size distribution would decide what is the overall collection efficiency. So basically, um, if you recall for the, um, for the settling chamber, we said if there are two different sizes, the collection efficiency have to be arranged in a way that is M1 e to 1 plus M2 eta 2 divided by m1 plus m2, right? So it depends on what is the fraction of particles at each specific size. And if we know the size distribution, if it's composed of multiple different sizes, then it's going to be mi eta i divided by the summation of, of all mi's, right? So this is the overall collection efficiency or the removal efficiency of a setup. So basically this problem gets, to, gets into a situation that we want to know what are the, all the eta i's. Because all the mi's are already provided here. So you see in each different size range, zero to two, it has the mass fraction of one, uh, six to 10 is mass fraction of 30, right? So basically we we'll have all the mi's ready. We just need to solve for what are the eta i's for each size bin. Right, does that make sense? Right, so then um, in terms of calculating eta i's, then we need to use these equations, right? So eta i is dependent on what is the size we're talking about. For example, here, if we want to calculate eta i, then we will use the average size, which is one micrometer as a size to calculate the collection efficiency. For example, for this size bin, we're going to use three micrometer, which is the average of the two bin boundaries, right? To calculate the collection efficiency. For this one is going to be five, right? This is going to be eight, so on and so forth. So to calculate the efficiency, we need to first know what is the cutoff size, right? So to calculate the cutoff size, we have to use this equation. This equation, we need to plug in the uh, basically, we need to plug in all of the parameters 
uh, in this equation, right? The, the uh, viscosity, the width of the inlet, right? The number of effective turns, we mentioned about how to calculate this earlier, right? And then the, um, the inlet velocity and the particle density, right? This is the gas density. So we can also put in some value here, but compared to the particle density, this is very negligible, okay? So based on this, um, based on this uh, process, so to calculate the collection efficiency it has to go the other way, right? So it has to go from here to here, and then finally plug in all these values into this table to calculate the overall collection efficiency. So let's do that, right? So here I have a, some blank space here. So we mentioned that the DPC is calculated by square root of nine mu W divided by two pi and E VI rho P minus rho G. So this is the equation that we use to calculate the cutoff size. Right, so the mu here is the gas with the gas uh, viscosity. Let's put it here. Mu viscosity. So you can find it from your textbook in appendix B two. Okay. <clears throat> so for these values, um, um, basically in that table, it gives you the. Um, the viscosity of air under different temperatures. The only thing is that all the units are not in standard, the standard units or international units. So you probably need to do some calculation to convert it into standard units. Because for, for this equation, if you want to calculate the parameters, all of them have to be in the same set of units or the standard units, okay? So by using that table, or if, and if, you, can, if you want to do that online, search for, the air viscosity um, under different temperature. So there should be some calculators where you can just put in the temperature to get the value there, okay? So under the condition of this problem, which is, um, which was uh, 350 Kelvin in one, at one atmosphere. So the viscosity is 2.1 multiplied by 10 to the negative five Pascal second. Okay, so this is the standard unit, right? And then we need to know what is the W. So W is the width of the inlet. So as we have shown here, if the, part, uh, if the body has a diameter of one meter, then the width of the inlet is 0.25, right? And then two pi, these are just the uh, constants, right? So NE, which is the number of effective turns, that's calculated by one over H LB plus half of the LC. Okay, you remember, um, so the number of effective turns really depends on um, the, the inlet or the height of inlet because after the particles are introduced into the cyclone, we mentioned that it's going to move or rotate as ribbons, right? So they're not going to stack on each other. So basically, the, the number of turns, let's say there are three turns here, for example, is really limited by the overall dimension of the uh, cyclone in the vertical direction and also the height of the inlet, right? So um, we can use this equation to calculate what is the number of effective turns. So basically, if we plug in the value here, the h is 0.5, if you remember here, h is 0.5 meters. LB is two meters, LC is two meters, right? So we have two plus one over two multiplied by two. This is going to be six, okay? So basically the effective, number of effective turns that the air have in this uh, cyclone is six, okay? And then finally, we need to calculate what is a VI here. So VI, as we mentioned, it's Q divided by W, multiplied by h, right? Vi is just the inlet velocity, right? 
in a velocity is just a flow rate divided by the cross section error because error goes inside from here right so uh, the flow rate you see that's um 150 meters cubed per minute right so to convert it into standard units so uh, we have to convert it into we have to convert it into meter cube per second right so that can be done by just dividing this value by 60 because each minute is 150 then each second is this value divided by 60 which is 2.5 meter cubed per second okay and then the w that is 0.25 meters the h is 0.5 okay so 0 0.2 0 0.5 meters multiplied by 0.25 meters okay so for this one uh, you can calculate that this is 20 meters per second okay so this is the inlet velocity okay so based on this calculation you can also find out the typical scale or the typical uh, range of the parameters right 20 meter per second is not a very small velocity right? so um, basically the air moves with a pretty fast speed going inside the cyclone and then it's going to get um, get removed in that sense right? so uh, and finally uh, actually we missed one parameter that's that is the rho p right rho p is a particle density so rho p we have it it's already 1600 kilogram per meter cube right so this is also in standard units and then the rho g is the gas density but we know that the gas density compared to the solid density is negligible so we don't really have to calculate this right we don't need to put this number in so now we can just plug in all of these parameters and calculate what is dpc so we need to make sure that all the units are standard units right so now we can plug in 9 multiply by 2.1 multiply by 10 to the negative 5 um, so i'll just ignore the units here okay because um um it's already all all of them are already in standard units so we can just plug in the values so w is 0.25 and then 2 3.14 multiplied by 6 multiplied by 20 multiplied by 1600 okay so if you have a calculator if you want you can type it in in your uh, web browser and see um, what is the value here? So I will just skip through that. Uh, so the final value here you can get is 6.26 multiplied by 10 to the negative 6 meters, which is actually 6.26 micrometers. Okay, so this is the cutoff size for this cyclone. It kind of makes sense, right? The cutoff size. Typically, the cyclones are most efficient for removing particles larger than a few microns. It's less efficient when it's removing particles smaller than, uh, let's say, in the nanometer range. Okay, so a few microns—that's the—that's kind of like the reasonable value for this cyclone here. Okay, so now once we have the DPC, we can easily calculate what is the collection efficiency or what is the removal efficiency for each particle size, right? So uh, since we have the table here, I might need to erase something. Um, but you can always find these derivations in, in our videos, okay? I'll just erase the contents here. All right. So with uh, each size being here, we can first calculate what is the DPJ, which is the particle size that we are, that we are interested in. Right, so we mentioned that to calculate the collection efficiency, we need to know what is a DPJ here. So DPJ is the average size. So based on these values, we can calculate the average size. Zero, so it's just average of zero and two, that's one. This is three, um, five, eight, 14, 24, 40, and 75. This is all in meters, uh, all in micrometers. So based on that, we can calculate 
what is the e to j? Right, e to j is just uh, one over one plus dpc divided by dpj squared, right? So we can plug in these values here. Uh, basically, for the first bin here, it's going to be one over one plus 6.26 divided by one squared, right? And then you're going to get 0.02. Okay, so this is a collection efficiency for the one micrometer particles, which is 2%, okay? So for the second one, you can do the same to plug in the, uh, the values of the DPJ. So that is, the final answer is 0.18. Third one is 0 0.39, 0.62, 0.83, 0.94. Okay. So based on this equation, you can calculate what is the collection efficiency for particles with different size bins, within different size bins, right? So you can see the larger the particles we get, the higher the efficiency. And the final size bin is almost 100% collection efficiency, right? So now we have all the E to J here, and we have the MJ, right? 1%, 9%, 10%, 30%, 30 Right, so all of them adding up together, that's 100%, right? So now we can use the equation where eta overall is equal to the summation of e to j, mj, divided by the summation of mj, right? So you can either treat this or treat this value as one or 100, okay? It really depends on how you define this uh, overall percentage, right? If you treat it as one, then all of these will be percentage. But if you treat it as 100, then you can directly use the value here. That's gonna be one, nine, uh, 10, 30, so on and so forth, right? So let's treat them as 100. Then basically the summation of all the MJ is going to be 100, right? because this is presenting each size range. So adding them all of, adding all of them together, is going to be 100%. And then we can calculate either J, MJ. And that's going to be 0 0.02, 1.68. Okay. So we'll multiply the efficiency by the mass concentration in each size bin. So this is what we get, okay? So once we get this column here, we just need to add all of them together, right? Make the summation and then divide by this total mass. And you can find out that the final answer is 68.2%, okay? So this is the overall collection efficiency of particles by the cyclone that we designed it or, or that we uh, calculated in this system, right? So um, in terms of the process, it's a little bit complicated, but uh, I hope this makes sense, right? So basically we calculate the, uh, we derive the cutoff size. And with that cutoff size, we can calculate what is the collection efficiency for particles with, within different size bins. And since we know the mass concentration, in each size bin, then we can calculate what is the final overall collection efficiency, right? Um, so you will get more practice uh, of this problem in your homeworks. I think two, maybe two problems related to this calculation process, right? So any questions before we move on? Everything good? Okay, yeah, so, um, you can use a similar method to look at your team project, okay? So in your team project, you will uh, first calculate what is the uh, PM emission rate, right? And then you can assume certain size distribution of the particles, or you can 
uh, basically go through some publications or articles on this uh, area. So I think there are people who measured the size distribution coming out of the co-boiler or the combustor. So with that size distribution, you should be able to calculate what is the removal efficiency of your cyclone. Okay, it's going to, uh, to uh, it's going to use the same process. So our project is not uh, something very uh, that needs a lot of complicated thoughts. It's basically piece by piece. So once you know how each part works, you can uh, combine them together and form a larger story. So uh, with this uh, contents here, you can try to look at how to design the cyclones or the pre cleaners, right? Um, so this is the process that's given on your textbook. If you go to example 4.1, so this is basically how, uh, how we did the calculation here. And then finally, with this column here, you can add them all together. This is the final answer. So they got 68.1. Uh, ours is uh, the calculation of my result is 68.2. It's not different by a lot. So uh, as long as let's say our results are within 5%, then I think we should be good. Okay. All right, so the final part of the cyclone is about its um, particle, uh, it's about this pressure drop, okay? So we mentioned that um, one, actually one disadvantage for the cyclone is about its pressure drop, or the flow resistance, mainly because we need to draw a high speed of the airflow through a narrow inlet. So if we have to do that, then um, basically the fan or the blower that's downstream of the cyclone have to give a lot of power to drag all of these flows through. So uh, we have to take that into consideration when we try to design our cyclones. Basically, that's going to affect the cost of the uh, of, of operating the cyclone. Right? Let's say if we want to remove all of the uh, particles, we can design a cyclone that has a very small dimension. Let's say the inlet can be this small, right? We can drag a large flow going through. Of course, the, the velocity is finally decided by the speed of sound, right? So that's the maximum velocity that it can get. But once we re reach that condition, then um, basically the pressure drop will be so large that the pump or the blower will not be able to maintain itself, right? So um, that's why in uh, real applications, we have to design relatively larger inlet in terms of the um, operating cyclones. So here it shows a few equations about how to calculate the pressure drop or the flow resistance operating cycle. Okay. So the pressure drop is calculated by one over two multiplied by rho g, vi, and hv. Okay, vi again is our uh, inlet gas velocity. Right? So once we know the flow rate, we can just divide that by the cross-section area, which is W multiplied by H, right? So rho G here is the gas density, right? And then the HV is the pressure drop or the uh, people all this also call this as the, um, the, the, the pressure head or, or some other terms, okay? So the HV here um, can be further calculated by this term. Okay, so it's dependent on a few uh, geometry parameters of the cyclone. So it depends on this K here. So K depends, uh, K is decided by the working condition, or what type of cyclone that we're trying to deal with. Right? You can find the detailed parameters in your textbook. Uh, so basically this is, a, um, this is a, a constant that people summarized uh, based on their experiences. Okay, and then it's dependent on the H and W Right, this is the inlet uh, cross-section area. And then um, we need to know that to draw the flow out of the system, it has to go through the outlet, right? If the outlet, this is DE, if the outlet is so narrow, then the pressure drop will be high again, right? So it has to divide by, its, uh, by the square of the DE. So theoretically, we should divide that by the area of the outlet, right? So that's pi over four multiplied by DE squared. But since here, we already assume certain constant, right? So we can just, uh, we can just put that pi over four into this K here, okay? And then directly use the inlet area, divide by the outlet area, or the square of the DE. So here you can see that 
basically the larger the inlet, let's say the larger the inlet area, then the higher the, um, basically the higher the HV, right? Then the higher the pressure drop. And the smaller the DE, right? If the DE is very small, we mentioned that if we make it, make it very narrow there, then um, basically the HV will be very high. And then that's going to increase the delta P. It's going to increase the pressure drop of the system, okay? And once the pressure drop is, uh, is high, it's going to affect the operating cost. So basically, um, we need to operate the, the fan or the blower continuously. Right? The pressure drop is going to affect the cost for maintaining the cyclone. And we're going to talk about the cost uh, with these associated with cyclones um, a few classes later, because we're going to talk about this cost for all different types of uh, particle removal devices all at once. Okay. So here you can see how the, uh, the dimension or design of the cyclone will also affect the pressure draw and also the operating cost of the system, right? Um, so that's all for the cyclones. Um, I think it's necessary to do a review and also the requirement about this device here. Uh, basically the requirement for, um, for understanding this uh, device, okay? So we need to understand how the mechanic, what is the mechanism of the particle removal for the cyclones? And uh, we need to know, need to know what, how to calculate the fraction efficiency, right? We need to know the cutoff sizes, right? And then use that equation to calculate the fraction efficiency. And we need to know how to calculate the pressure drop with these equations. So these are quite simple equations. So, um, but sometimes when you try to design the entire system, right, you might get uh, overwhelmed. Um, so try to, uh, I would say, try to start from the basics and then come up with a design, okay? Um, so that's all for the cyclones. This class, we're going to learn a little bit more about the, our next device, which is the electrostatic precipitator. Um, but before we talk about that PM removal device, we need to first know some backgrounds regarding the electrostatic force. I think in your physics class, uh, you learned about the electrostatic uh, force, which is calculated by Q multiplied by E. So electrostatic force, it's just that the number of charges, right? The electronic charges or the positive charges multiplied by field strains. Right? This is the, um, how we can apply a force on a charge or on a particle. So if the particle carries certain charges and then we put them into an electric field, we can also move them away, right? So this is where the idea of removing particles uh, come from. So what we can do is we can um, bring all of these charges or electrons to the particles, right, the highly concentrated PM, and then expose them under certain electric field. And then because of that electric field, it's going to move the particles all around, right? It can get attached onto certain surfaces. Too. So basically, um, the typical uh, electrostatic precipitator for removing those particles can achieve almost or higher than 95% of the particles, okay? It can give you a very high constant, uh, very high efficiency for removing particles. So we will talk about the, um, the theory or mechanism of the ESP next class. But this class, we can introduce something that's quite interesting, okay? So uh, I think maybe quite many of you have known or have used Kindle, okay? So I'm not sure if you have ever wondered how a Kindle works. So um, basically, if you go through this website, let's say, can just show that here. The website is eink.com. Yeah, so this website is a, is a company that manufacture these uh, electronic inks. Okay. So you can click here and actually see how they work. Yeah. 
Yeah, so, so the way it works is that um, for each pixel that's on the Kindle or on these electronic books, so each Kindle is composed of a small capsule. It's composed of a unit here. So inside this capsule, uh, it's composed of charged particles. The particles can have different color, and they also have charges attached on them. So what happens is that if we alternate the electric field that's applied on the Kindle, we can move the inks around. So it's going to show different contrast. Basically, right now it's showing white, right? And then if you change the, basically the electric field of the, uh, of the system, the white, part can, white particles can move down, black particles move up. They can mix together, together. the contrast is a little bit low. If you change the electric field here as well, then you're going to show black color. Okay. So this is using the electrostatic force that's acting on the particles. Uh, so this is their one uh, ink or the, the two, pig two pigment system. So it's going to show two different colors and then mixed contrast, right? So actually you can design um, systems that have three color here as well. It depends on the size of the particle. If you, let's say, if you charge the, if some of the particles have a smaller size, then their movement will be different in this small pixel here. So you can, um, by changing the electric field here, you can move the particles around and then um, to show different colors. Let's say right now it's showing white, it's showing red, and then by further changing that, you can show black. Okay. And then, I think that now they, they come up with more pigments, more colors here. So this is using the electrostatic force acting on the particles to show the, uh, basically to show different um, symbols or to show the arrangement of the ink on the, uh, on the Kindle so that uh, when you hold a Kindle, when you read the, read the uh, paragraph or read something on the Kindle, you will see it looks like real ink, right? So one advantage, I think this is one of their adver advertisement. So it reads like a real book because it is real ink showing on that, right? So if it's under dark, dark environment, you can't see the book, right? You can't see the kingdom very well. But I'm not sure if you notice one thing. So nowadays, we also use the iPad. So you see right now here, I'm coding one. So for the iPad, um, you see if, if you read the same book there and you want to flip pages, so there are some differences uh, in King, between Kindle and iPad. So iPad is uh, using these uh, uh, LED or uh, whatever the, the electronic system there. So if you want to flip a page, it's very smooth, right? It's, the response is very high as well. But for Kindle, if you want to flip a page, you see the response is pretty slow. So if you click next page, and it's going to respond for some time, sometimes all the word will be gone, right? So it's blank, blank out, and then the word is going to show up. So it's the response is quite slow. So is there a reason for why it's having a slow response? And we can actually do a very quick calculation with the drag force and electrostatic force to see why it has a slow response, okay? So let's say we can, back to the slides here. See, um, basically the way the um, Kindle works or the electronic ink works is based on the electric field, right? So by changing different electric field, we can change the arrangement of the ink. So we're mentioning about the comparison between these two. I'm not saying that uh, which one is better, which one is worse, right? So I think it's totally depends on our preference, but just by, um, the process of flipping, flipping the pages, we can see some difference in there. So we can actually calculate what is the response or why the response of the Kindle is kind of slow when we flip the pages, okay? So let's make some assumptions. So these assumptions are also the typical working conditions of a, um, of a Kindle. So let's assume that we're talking about a device that's this large, right? It's composed of, many, many pixels in there. And inside each pixel, we have that capsule of ink there, right? 
So let's say we're just talking about this one. And then we know that it has an external electric field, right? Let's assume that right now it's positive on the top and negative on the bottom, right? We have this uh, tiny capsule here and there's a lot of ink particles, ink particles inside. So these are the black particles, these are the white particles, okay? So let's say um, now we decide to switch the polarity, plus and minus. We know that these black particles are going to move up, mainly because we charge them as positive particles, and then these are the negative particles, the, the white ones. If we switch the polarity, the white particles are going to move down, and then black particles are going to move up. So once there's this uh, external uh, field or the movement of the particles, we know that the particle is going to move uh, in relative to its environment, right? So there's a relative velocity. We know that once there's a relative velocity, there's drag force, right? So let's assume that uh, we're talking about the particles that's at the bottom, the black ink, part, black ink particles. We know that it has gravity, mg, right? It has the electrostatic force, qe, trying to move them upwards. And they're also trying to move in relative to the external uh, environment, right? We have the fd, the drag force, that's trying to pull it down, okay? So, also, let's assume that they're in steady state. Which means that the particles move with a constant velocity. So what that means is that the force is going to balance here, where QE is going to be equal to mg plus fd. You know that fd, again, the, the drag force is Three pi mu dp multiplied by vr divided by c, right? Three pi mu dp vr divided by c. Okay. So let's assume that these ink particles are larger than one micro, and it's indeed the case. So if you see the um, uh, if you see the uh, that website, so typically these ink particles are a few microns, right? If there are a few microns, one, th one thing we can know is that the C here, the Cunningham correction factor, we can treat it as one, okay? So uh, let's do this. Maybe to make things a little bit on the, uh, on the extreme side, let's just assume that particle have a size of one micron, okay? So further assume that C is equal to one, and then we can write out this equation here. QE equal to mg plus three pi mu dp multiplied by V, all right? Um, so we can also, by checking the dimension of the um, Kindle here or the E-ink system here, we typically know that the thickness of each pixel or each capsule here is 0.1 millimeter. 0.1 millimeter is very thin there, right? it's just 100 microns. It's a very small dimension, and there we have to fill in all the ink, ink particles. So now we, with that information, we can calculate what is the E, what is the electric field, okay? The electric field is just V divided by the distance. So here, this is distance. V divided by 0.1 multiplied by 10 to the negative three. So the V here is the, is the voltage that we apply on the, uh, on the Kindle, right? So this voltage can't be very high, otherwise people might get shocked when they, when they touch the surface, right? We know that the safe voltage, DC voltage that we can use is around 110, uh, 120 volts. For safety reasons, let's just assume that this voltage is 50 volts, okay? We can, we can use 50 here. 0.1 multiplied by 10 to the negative three. And you can see that this is a very strong electric field. Okay, five multiplied by 10 to the fifth volts per meter. So this is the field strength. Okay, 
And then <clears throat> with this information, we can further assume that particle carry one charge, one electron, and then we can plug in all of these uh, particle diameters and uh, the viscosities here. And you can find out that finally the V here is four multiplied by 10 to the negative four meter per second, which is 0.4 millimeter per second, okay? And in order to let, so this V here is the velocity of the ink particles, right? So in order to let these ink particles to move up for this 0.1 millimeter, and that's just going to be D divided by V, 0.1 divided by 0.4, which is 0.25 seconds. Okay, 0.25 seconds is already pretty long. You can feel that, right? It's not infinitely short. Right. So that's why, uh, based on these simple calculations, you can find out why typically the Kindle has, or the e ink system, have a slow, slower response compared to these uh, uh, LED or these uh, iPad systems. Right. So this is just a quick example of how we can use the electrostatic force. So next class, we're going to talk about the ESP, and how to remove particles from those systems. All right. So uh, let me know if you guys have any questions. Uh, you guys have a nice weekend.